Um, Karen, are you okay to talk about uh, parent ping and uh, the, the type of work um, that you've been doing in the UK? Yes, so I'm in the car now, so I'll do this bit and then we'll try and drive home. Oh, sorry, that's the radio one. Um, ping is a bit like teach tap, which some people might have heard of before, in that we ask parents three questions a day, and we've been doing this throughout the lockdown period so we launched in June last year um, and so the main data that I've got to share with you today is from the second lockdown in England which happened between January and um, about, um, March um, and so we've been looking at what happened during home learning during that period. And can I ask you now that we have you um, <laughs> Also to talk a little bit about, um, I mean, I remember you saying that uh, some of the findings from Parent Ping were also around the role of fathers, right? Um, and also understanding what homeschooling looked like in the UK. Yeah, in terms of what it looked like, it looked very different um, in this most recent block of homeschooling. So the 2021 homeschooling compared to when we had it, uh, when the virus first emerged in 2020. Um, but having said that, it was very varied across schools. So um, in some schools, up to half the pupils were still in. So schools in England were still open to learners who were classed as vulnerable. So they might have had a special educational need. They might have been uh, living in poverty. Um, it was also open to key workers, which means our medical professionals, but also people who uh, work in supermarkets and things like that. So up to half the kids were still in school and the teachers were having to, to work out how to provide for that. Um, just over half of uh, schools provided some sort of online lesson, particularly for English and maths. But it's really hard to say what was happening across the whole country because actually every school coped a little bit differently and, and therefore all parents had to cope a little bit differently. Yeah, so um, some of the outcomes from parents paying um, um, also talk about the number of hours that parents would spend on homeschooling, right? And the role mm -hmm. of fathers. Can you talk a bit, little bit about that? Yeah, so the government said that um, schools should provide for primary schools uh, three hours of learning a day. And actually that seems to be, seems to have translated in very much into, into what happened. So certainly for the first, say third, the first three weeks of our lockdown, um, around 70% of parents reported that their kids spent three hours or more a day doing their homeschooling activities. Um, it dropped off a little bit after that um, and plateaued at around 50 to 60 percent of parents saying that more than three hours was being spent each day. Um, so there, there was a fair amount. I mean, I, I'm sure there's been other people who've made the comment during the conference that home learning and the time they spent on it doesn't actually equate to, to learning. We, we still don't know about that and it's very hard even as parents to, to give an accurate representation of what what was really going on during that time. Um, but, but that's how long they spent doing their work. Um, and I think the, the finding in regard to fathers that you're referring to is um, at around Christmas time, um, we asked whether with hindsight, families felt closer as a result of having spent time in the pandemic. And they, they did. Um, about three quarters of families reported that and it was particularly prevalent amongst the dads so we might all need a little bit of space to process this but I guess my takeaway from that is that it's not all bad that there have been some benefits to the lockdown learning for some families um, and we need to remember that when we're talking about uh, the impacts of COVID on the, the younger generation. Yeah do you find any variation across types of families though or across the country? A little bit, but not as much as you'd expect. So we looked um, using eligibility for free school meals um, as a proxy for, for deprivation. Um, 
and we we found some differences so um children spent slightly less time on the schoolwork but only by sort of eight or nine percent it, it wasn't a big difference um similarly the parents said that they found um their confidence in that um in supporting their children during lockdown learning was a little bit lower for the parents whose children were eligible for free school meals but but not not a lot just again around 10 percent, no more than that um yeah we also measured anxiety on a weekly basis and looked at how that might be different between those with free school meals and those who are not um and it was really interesting so it was clustered um those who were eligible for free school meals felt had a lower level of anxiety and a higher level of anxiety whereas those who were not eligible were much more in that middle category um so the the pressures that they felt were more extreme but also lower in some cases and we think that it might be lower because the parents were at home so thinking about what caused that anxiety the causes of stress we asked about this and for parents whose children were eligible for preschool meals um finances money problems the cost of schooling at home was what worried them um, compared to those who were not on free school meals and for them their bigger concern was about how they're going to cope with their own work. So if you can think of the, the parents who might be spending all day working um, and trying to homeschool at the same time, that's a very different type of pressure um, to those who might not have a daytime job or might have been furloughed due to the um, lockdown and were able to support the homeschooling. So there were differences, but perhaps they're not as big as you might have expected. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. I really appreciate you uh, just <laughs> pitching in like oh, that. Oh, I'm so sorry about the time. Difference. No, I think we've we've got all of you that we need uh, in terms oh, of information. Tell you what, least. I'm going to drive home. I'm going to turn my video off. I'm going to keep listening. And if I get home in time for the Q and A, maybe I can join in again. Yeah, great. Um, thank you. And I'll turn over to Anna now um, uh, and, uh, and ask you kind of the same questions. If you could, first of all, maybe talk a little bit about what homeschooling in the Netherlands looked like for parents. Yeah, I think it's very similar to what uh, Karen described for, uh, for the UK. So I think it was quite different uh, how schools organized it, especially in the first lockdown. Maybe now it's a little bit more uh, streamlined and organized um but i think they all provided some kind of work for the children to do at home and then they provided different kinds of support uh from the school so that could be uh either uh, some kind of video conference that karen also talked about um either uh, live or via uh, uh little instruction videos that we also use in the higher education um and also different degrees of uh opportunities for the children to um interact with teachers and parents uh, and peers uh and to ask questions so i think different yeah can you talk a little bit about what was expected of parents um i mean maybe it's difficult to get that picture given that the netherlands is a very decentralized system and every school will have had its own approach almost but, but do, do you have a, an, an overview of, of what that would have looked like? Um, yeah, so one thing I found consistently over uh, all kinds of sources on the internet is that uh, parents were not expected to be teachers. So I think that's important. Um, but uh, having said that, I think there were a lot of things that were expected from parents. So their main task would be like make children do um, the schoolwork uh, that they got, but also they were encouraged um, to provide learning uh, possibilities outside of that uh, official schoolwork. So um, make use of uh, internet sources or uh, programs that were on the television or involve children in more informal forms of learning, um, uh, involve them in chores that could promote learning like cooking or something like that. And I checked on the site of the Dutch Youth Institute, Institute uh, NEE, 
and they have a very long list of what uh, parents could do uh, during homeschooling. So also um, in addition to uh, like the official tasks, also things like um, reduce stress, provide physical activities, um, talk with the child, provide emotional support, uh, provide healthy food, um, structure, monitor screen time. So all kinds of uh, responsibilities that came on top of like the normal responsibilities that parents had. Yeah. So when I hear that long list, um, I can imagine that the level of stress for parents is, is quite high um, or was quite high uh, over the past year. And this is something that you measured. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah, so we measured um, subjective experiences of parents in terms of uh, stress and um, satisfaction um, of, that they got from homeschooling. And also there we saw a wide range. So for some parents, it was more stressful than for others. And if I look at the, um, the average, uh, it tended to go to the positive. So um, yeah, if you look on a scale from one to 10, so they would get a, a six uh, for uh, the experiences they had with homeschooling. So barely satisfactory, but uh, yeah, towards the yeah. positive side. Does that vary across families? Do you find any kind of background indicators, conditions that would kind of impact on their level of stress? The things that we looked at, surprisingly enough, did not um, correlate with any of that uh, subjective experiences. So neither did uh, SES or number of children or uh, migration background um, or any kinds of previous experiences that they had like before the pandemic with the teaching. Um, but we did look at some child experiences and we saw some uh, correlations there. So um, the more motivated the child was, the more positive the experience of the parent. Uh, and if the child had a preference for homeschooling um, rather than going to school, it was also more positive. So there might be more uh, yeah, other predictors for that subjective experience than uh, background variables, at least in our data. Yeah, so it almost makes you think about what kind of personal characteristics of children uh, would make that homeschooling yeah. a more fruitful experience almost. I mean, this is not my area of research. Um, is that something that you would know about? Um, it would be something I would like to look into next. Um, so now we uh, only focused on um, the previous experiences of the parents and contextual variables. Um, but especially because, um, yeah, we found that the child uh, characteristic at the same time uh, of measurement um, had at least some correlation with that. That would be something I would want to look at in the, in the future. Yeah, it almost makes you think that um, the school environment um, is not the best place of learning for every child. Um, that's some, and I guess that's something that we see uh, in assessment outcomes as well, where some students have actually done much better at home. So at least if you think about it from the perspective of learning outcomes in uh, cognitive subjects, which is of course a very small uh, and restricted view on what schooling is for. Um, and there are many other ways to uh, have uh, children go into schools, such as interaction with peers and learning how to, how to engage with others, which is a very important element of, of school as well, obviously. But if we just look at it solely from the perspective of, of learning academic subjects, then maybe the school is, is not the best place for every child to be in, I guess. It might be a, a question uh, uh, to consider, I guess. Um, uh, you've also looked at the number of hours that, that parents actually spend on, on homeschooling. Can you talk a little bit about that, how that varies and, and whether that's, and, and what, if that's a good enough amount or not? 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. So time-wise, um, it's very similar to what uh, Karen found uh, in their study. Um, so we saw that um, mothers spend about three hours uh, on supervising homeschooling. Um, partners spend a little bit less, uh, around two hours. And children themselves spend about four hours every day on average. But there was also a big range from zero to eight hours a day uh, that we saw. Um, yeah, and, and how whether, does that vary by background of parents then? No, we didn't. Uh, we didn't find any uh, correlations with that either. Um, although um, what Karen just said about the uh, anxiety measure that uh, made me think that maybe we should look at it also differently. Um, whether uh, maybe there might be some differences in the low end in the high end, um, because we didn't check that now. Um, but I could imagine that that um, could also be the case here that, for example, the lower SES families, uh, some spent more time at home, uh, while others spent more time uh, in the in critical work, for example. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm also wondering whether having two working parents would affect uh, the amount of, of homeschooling. Is that something that you found, Anna? Um, we didn't actually look at that, but almost all parents in our sample are two parent families. Um, so we have a very low risk uh, sample in that regard, also with regard to uh, SES differences. So we're mostly in the higher end. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, I don't think we have a lot of what uh, Karen talked about, um, people who are who would be eligible for school meals. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess the number of hours that they spend on home homeschooling is also quite interesting in that it makes you think that um, the amount of actual instructional time in schools would probably, I don't know, uh, maybe perhaps be in the similar range where many hours in the school are actually spent on other types of, of activities and not kind of dedicated uh, on task learning perhaps. Yeah. Is that something that you could speak to as well? Was that for me or for Karen? I didn't. Uh... Yeah, for both of you, I okay. guess. Um... I would be interested in hearing from somebody who has teaching uh, experience, maybe how that would um, relate to actual hours uh, working on task. Um, I read a report from the NCO, um, but here that there were actually um, some uh, yeah, decreases in learning loss over the last year. So that would make you expect that maybe it wasn't enough or maybe it wasn't qualitatively um, as good yeah. as what they would do uh, at school. Um, but I don't know, um, based on our findings, um, what to make of that, if it was enough or not. Yeah. But you, Karen, can you respond to that? And then maybe if we have teachers in the audience, we'd love to hear from you as well. Yeah, we don't have data on it either, but I've read some really interesting studies and, and just some narratives from parents um, thinking about kids who um, are either very high ability or, or lower ability, who are working outside of kind of the normal pace that you would get in class. And some of those kids worked a lot better they, their parents say during lockdown because you know at the top end they're not having to wait for everyone else they might finish their work in 10 minutes and they can see from the start of the day a lot we found a lot of uh, work was set kind of at the start of the day and then kids could work through it at their own pace and that really benefited those who work a lot faster or a lot slower than the norm um, so it's really interesting but um, as with Anna um, there are a number of studies emerging um, across England that show that there have been quite significant learning losses, that kids aren't where you would expect them to be if it had have been a normal year. Um, although one of the nice caveats that I've seen in those reports is that that doesn't mean no learning happened, just a little less than mm. normal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Um, and maybe Karen, I can ask you to also share maybe the link to uh, parent ping in the in the chat because I see that there are some questions on maybe more background to the work that you do. And I know that you are going to publish uh, a report soon, but can't really share anything from that yet. But if we have the website, then we can keep a lookout uh, uh, to some of the data coming out uh, from the UK. Um, maybe as a final question, Anna, I can also ask you if you could reflect on the role of parent, of fathers particularly. Um, some of, of what Karen was talking about in that is particularly fathers who've seen a maybe change in relationship with their child um, as a result of homeschooling. Is that something that we find in the Netherlands as well? I thought that was a really interesting and also a, a nice finding um, that not all has been bad so um that's nice um i don't know we haven't looked at that data yet um in our uh, study we do have some uh, information about uh, family relations um, and how that went during that whole period um however what we did see was that mothers in our study did uh, significantly more of the homeschooling and also work less and that uh, concurs with um, findings from other studies as well that um, maybe women are more negatively affected um, by the, the lockdown measures uh, than men. Um, so I'm not sure if we find these uh, positive family effects as well, but I really hope that maybe some things have been set in motion during this whole uh, thing. Um, that things move towards better compatibility of uh, work life and family life, for example, by um, making home office more available, especially for, for women as well, if they want yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. And the final question uh, from the chat, uh, thank you, Petri, for asking that, um, is... Um, Maybe, yes, maybe if I phrase it a bit more broader, do we know what strategies schools use to contact parents during COVID-19? I mean, in the Netherlands, initially, we had quite a lot of discussion around children disappearing. Um, so uh, not uh, so schools not being able to connect to children, but then probably also not being able to connect to their parents. Um, and um, Anna, uh, that, that's from your work as well, as well and, as, and uh, other work in the Institute where the importance of the kind of homeschool partnership is, is really important. Um, do we know uh, the, whether schools struggled with that, what they did to, to ensure that, that good relationship over the, over the lockdown, what, how did that uh, develop? Um, Maybe you first. Karen first. <laughs> oh, right, yes. Yeah. Um, so we don't know precisely how they were being contacted. I know they certainly used a whole range of different approaches to set the work for the children predominantly via email, but also a lot of the, the different um, web-based platforms that, that schools are using. But one question we did ask, ask, which perhaps gets to the nub of this question, is we asked parents how supported they felt by their schools. And actually, overwhelmingly, the parents responded very positively on that. So they did feel, on the whole, and again, we're talking about norms here and statistical uh, majorities rather there will always be the outlier stories um, and the kids and the parents who had a, a dreadful time um, but on the whole the majority of parents felt very well supported by their schools. Great. How about Netherlands Anna? Yeah I, we also don't have the data about how they did it but um, as you mentioned like what we see in our data is that especially the resources that parents already have uh, in terms of supporting learning at home, um, those are the one the things that predict also how well they did or adapted to the whole homeschooling uh, situation. Um, so that would be definitely something that I would like to uh, support schools to do uh, even after uh, this um, situation to better prepare parents and to make them more yeah. connected to what uh, children actually do at school. 
Yeah, and I guess that's some of the that's one of the lessons for all of us during the pandemic, I guess, is that you need to invest and build those relationships. And if you didn't have those in place before the pandemic, then trying to build those when a school is closed is is probably going to be really difficult. So yeah. I imagine that this uh, this will be kind of a reflection of what was in place before schools closed also. Um, I guess that's the end of our session. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Karen, especially for uh, being so flexible. Um, no, I'm so sorry, I got the times wrong. <laughs> no, I'm really pleased that you were able to connect in the end. Uh, so thank you for, for sharing your time with us. Um, and thank you, Anna, for your reflection from the Netherlands as well and, and everyone for joining in the conversation. We have a final keynote uh, by uh, Dirk van Damme, who was previously at the OECD, but just recently retired. I'm really looking forward to his uh, talk as well. So I hope to see you in the final session as well. Um, yeah, see you uh, at the session, hopefully. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. Bye. Bye.